All right, so um, we're very pleased to introduce our next speaker for today, uh, Professor uh, Robin Bloom. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Robin is a, a professor at Michigan State University and also a mind at the same college. Uh, she's done uh, really great work on a number of topics in philosophy of cognitive science, for example, on the history and philosophy of dual process theories of cognition. Uh, she's also done work in philosophy of psychiatry, including her work on um, the RDOC framework for thinking about cognitive ontologies and psychiatry. Um, she's also done work on uh, the topic of neurofeminism, or how to avoid neurosexism, uh, and interpretations of gender differences in cognition uh, research in uh, functional MRI. Um, in addition to that, she's also done significant work on uh, evidence-based uh, medicine and on um, how to uh, best uh, take the evidence that we have to make medical decisions in the context of bioethics. So uh, a broad uh, range of interests. And today she's going to talk to us as, about the art as an ontology for psychiatry Thank you. Okay, so Sarah started her talk this morning by saying that she was kind of coming at this ontology question sideways. I'm actually coming at it heads up, head on, but in a really specific framework or a really specific context. So RDOC is a framework that has fairly recently been developed by National Institutes of Mental Health for guiding research into the neural basis of psychiatric conditions. Um, and I want to start by just setting some context or some background for the talk. So first, as Joe mentioned, I do work in both philosophy of medicine and philosophy of neuroscience. And so philosophy of psychiatry for me, and especially thinking about RDOC, is where those two things intersect. So this is probably at least as much a philosophy of medicine talk as it is a philosophy of neuroscience talk. Second thing you should know is that I really, really want our doc to work. So I have this dream of like Star Trek medicine where you scan the patient with your tricorder and tells you everything you need to know, what the prognosis is, and how to treat the patient, and boom, you're good. But I also lean very heavily toward the constructivist, pragmatist, pluralist, anti-pluralist spectra, uh, end of all of those philosophical spectra. So I'm constantly in this battle between my temperament and my philosophical commitments and my optimism. Which brings me to the third thing I need to say, which is that when I submitted my abstract for this talk, I thought, okay, so I'm feeling pretty good about RDOC right now. I have written a paper in which I say that it's actually not going to be a great ontology for psychiatry, but I had been planning to talk about how it could actually be a really good ontology for neuroscience. And I've completely changed my mind about that, at least temporarily. So I've also changed my title. So I'm using the metaphor of our doctor getting us out of the fire and into the frying pan to indicate that I think that we're still in a really uncomfortable place with our doc, but that at least at least might buy us some time to figure out a longer term solution to our so I want to start by spending a little bit of time talking about the two ontologies that are at play in psychiatry right now, the um, traditional ontology that comes out of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. It's the one that currently guides diagnosis and psychiatric billing and patient self-conceptions and diagnostic labels. And then this alternative of uh, RDOC, and um, I'll briefly survey some of the problems with the DSM that led the NIH to think that RDOC was a good idea. In a way, RDOC is really, really radical. It's aiming to completely get rid of our current diagnostic categories and replace them with something much more biologically informed. But in the second part of the talk, I actually want to argue that in a way, RDOC is not radical at all. It's just basically the most uh, recent iteration of this continuing uh, mode of thought in, by, among biologically oriented psychiatrists. And given that background and given the problems with RDOC, I will then go on and talk about some of the challenges for RDOC um, as an ontology for neuroscience and for psychiatry. So, starting the DSM and RDOC. So, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders is now in its fifth edition. That, that edition was released in 2013. And really, it's largely unchanged since the third edition of the DSM, which was released in 1980. Um, there had been, during the something like 15 years that this revision was planned, a lot of optimism about changes that could be made to 
make the diagnostic categories more biologically oriented and more biologically informed about moving from a categorical to a dimensional type of diagnosis, which I'm not going to talk much about, but we can address in the question period. But really what ended up happening were some fairly minimal changes, and uh, underlying all of that is that the um, diagnosis of <coughs> psychiatric disorders is almost entirely by patient self-reporting of symptoms. So for example, we can look at the DSM-5 criteria for depression. There are nine criteria of which a patient needs to meet five, one of which has to be criterion one, depressed mood, or criterion two, loss of pleasure, and then any of the other uh, criteria. There are also some um, aspects that are not uh, featured in this list. So for example, the patient has to be experiencing clinically significant distress or difficulty functioning in daily life. There's also some additional criteria that rule out other explanations, so distinguishing depression from bipolar disorder, for example, or schizophrenic, uh, schizoaffective disorder. But generally, this is the core of the DSM-5 criteria. It's pretty universally accepted right now that the DSM has problems. It can be very useful in a clinical sense, though um, a friend of mine, Mona Gupta, has done some research on how psychiatrists make diagnoses in psychiatry, and it turns out that they generally don't follow the DSM criteria. Um, but they're at least a, a good sort of framework or, or context within which to work. Uh, the problems have been identified by psychiatrists, by psychologists, by philosophers, and probably the three main ones are that the categories in DSM, so the ontology produced by the DSM, uh, is marked by significant heterogeneity, by comorbidity, and at bottom by lack of validity. So if we look again at these criteria for depression, you could have two patients diagnosed with major depressive disorder, one of whom has all of the criteria in the first column. Um, so any five of the nine must include one of these two. That patient would indeed be diagnosed with depression with the other uh, caveats in mind. And then one patient who has depressed mood and then the four categories in the second column. So really all that these patients have in common is one symptom. And it gets even worse if you think about the fact that uh, one of the criteria is weight loss or weight gain or increase or decrease of appetite. Uh, a patient could have insomnia or hypersomnia, could be um, experiencing psychomotor agitation, or psychomotor, psychomotor retardation, so very slow, um, or agitation, very agitated. We could talk about the distinction between both and four and four. So, so really this is, by, by saying you could have patients that overlap with only one symptom, I'm presenting sort of a more optimistic interpretation of how these criteria should work. And probably the most well-known uh, example of heterogeneity in the DSM uh, comes from this paper from 2015, or sorry, 2013, so right around the time that the DSM-5 was introduced. Galatza, Levy, and Bryant looked at the new diagnostic criteria, did some math, and said, look, there are 636,120 different ways to have post-traumatic stress disorder. Turns out post-traumatic stress disorder is actually reasonably common, and so there are at least a couple of post-traumatic stress disorder patients out there who do have the same symptoms, but by and large, there's going to be an awful lot of heterogeneity. And even though this paper gets cited quite a bit in philosophy of psychiatry, people don't tend to point out that this is based on the DSM-5 criteria. They did the same thing for the DSM-4 criteria, and I don't know if you can see that, but under the DSM-4 criteria, there were only just under 80,000 different ways to have PTSD. So really the problem is getting worse and so better. There's also the issue of comorbidity. So in some ways, comorbidity is a really important concept. We certainly would not want it to be the case that we expect patients to have one and only one health problem, whether it's a physical health problem or a mental health problem. But the DSM has basically been designed to, um, and I'm not sure exactly how explicitly this was the case, I think they did want to make room for it, but they um, really have created criteria that overlap enough that there's a fair amount of so PTSD, again, has significant overlap with depression, with other anxiety disorders, with substance abuse disorders. Uh, the um, National Comorbidity Survey, which is a massive epidemiological study of mental health disorders, 
estimates that 79% of women and 88% of men with PTSD have at least one other DSM diagnosis. The personality disorders are also a notorious area where this is the case. Um, and in a DSM-4 source book, literature and all talked about a patient who met criteria for, at the time there were 10 personality disorders in the DSM-4, and this patient met criteria for all of them. I don't know what it would be like to sit and have a coffee with them, <laughs> but um, clearly there's something strange going on with the diagnosis, uh, uh, the diagnostic categories that this can be the case. And at bottom, really what this is, or the way that people are understanding this, and I think they're right, is that the DSM is in a crisis of validity. So essentially, the disorders that appear in the DSM do not actually map onto what's really going on when patients have mental health disorder. So philosophers talk about this in terms of the DSM failing to pick out natural kinds. We've already heard uh, in a couple of the talks the idea of carbon nature and its joints. Uh, I don't think anybody believes that it's, oh, it's going to be possible to give necessary and sufficient conditions for any particular uh, mental health diagnosis, but there's been a lot of discussion of since DSM categories are not natural kinds, how do we best think about them? Are they something like practical kinds or fuzzy kinds? There's an immense literature on this. Psychologists talk about it in terms of the DSM lacking construct validity, but essentially they're pointing at the same thing. The issue is that um, the criteria, the ontology given to us by the DSM really doesn't map all that much <coughs> onto the reality. And of course, this is going to have implications for biological psychiatry. So for the past few decades, there's been a lot of research on uh, neurobiology and genetics of mental disorders. But really, there hasn't been a lot of progress in understanding or developing an explanation about the neurobiology underlying these disorders. And because of that, presumably, there's also been relatively little impact on the clinical utility of this research in terms of shaping diagnosis prognosis or um, options for treatment. So this is really the aspect that bothered the developers of art. They are funding people doing this kind of research. They found that the research was not giving the kinds of results that they had initially hoped for. So in 2008, the NIH strategic plan talked about developing an alternative framework to guide research, something that um, replaced the DSM categories for research purposes with categories that were more um, aligned with or informed by current best work in neuroscience and in psychology. And in 2010, RDOC was introduced in a series of articles in various medical journals. So this is a screenshot of the American Journal of Psychiatry paper by Insel and colleagues. So Tom Insel was the director of the NIMH at that point. Um, and their introduction more or less recaps the problems that I've talked about. So they say current versions of the DSM and the ICD, so the International Classification of Disorders has similar problems, have facilitated reliable clinical diagnosis, and I'll have a bit more to say about that later. Uh, reliable clinical diagnosis and research. However, problems have increasingly been documented over the past several years, both in clinical and research areas. <laughs> Diagnostic categories based on clinical consensus fail to align with findings emerging from clinical neuroscience and genetics. The boundaries of these categories have not been predictive of treatment response. And perhaps most important, which I think is a really fascinating thing to flag, perhaps most important, based upon presenting signs and symptoms, oh, these categories based upon presenting signs and symptoms may not capture fundamental underlying mechanisms of dysfunction. One consequence has been to slow the development of new treatments targeted to underlying pathophysiological mechanisms. So how many of you are familiar with our doctor, at least because I have a few slides kind of walking through it in a little bit of detail just to make sure that everybody understands what's going on. But the first thing that I want to point out is that three years later, Tom Insel wrote a blog post on his NIMH blog, the director's blog, saying that going forward, NIMH would be reorienting its research away from DSM categories. That the aim of RDOC is to transform diagnosis by incorporating genetics, imaging, cognitive science, and other levels of information to lay the foundation for the classification system. The reason that I'm flagging this is that this um, blog post was published 
about two weeks before the DSM-5 was officially launched. So as you can imagine, this is a pretty uncomfortable moment. I don't know what kind of conversations went, along behind, went on behind the scenes, but a week or so after this blog post, in some co-published uh, press release or another uh, blog post with Jeffrey Lieberman, who was the incoming president of the A Psychiatric A, and one of the people who had been involved in promoting the, the new DSM, um, in which they emphasized the shared interests of DSM and of RDOC, reassured people that the DSM is still state of the art for <coughs> clinical work, for diagnosis, and that um, RDOC was intended just for research. Um, though at the same time, it's very clear that the ultimate bet that the NIH is making is that this research will ultimately have a clinical importance, that it will transform diagnosis. So RDOC is clearly meant as an ontology for psychiatry, an alternative ontology that is fundamentally different to the current one. Uh, in the AJP article that I, I mentioned earlier, um, and some of his colleagues say that the current diagnostic categories are failing both psychiatrists and patients in large part, and again, this is the emphasis here, that these categories based upon presenting signs and symptoms may not capture fundamental underlying mechanisms of dysfunction. So there's this sense that there's something going on that RDOC is better able to help us to understand, elucidate, perform experiments to clarify. And also, RDOC is intended explicitly to be integrative. So it is very brain-based, but at the same time, RDOC is intended to integrate many levels of information that will better understand basic, or better, enable us to better understand basic dimensions of functioning. And this comes from an older version of the RDOC website, so around 2011. The current um, wording that expresses this idea is not terribly different. And again, the idea is that ultimately, research using the RDOC framework will result in a new set of classifications that are rooted in basic neuroscience. And RDOC begins with understandings of brain behavior relationships and then links them to clinical phenomena. So it's essentially kind of a bottom-up approach in that we're, we're thinking about the biology and then trying to figure out how that relates to um, clinical phenomena, whereas the DSM starts by, and I'll say more about this in a bit, by identifying clinical phenomena and then goes and hunts for the appropriate brain-related organs. So RDOC is essentially a giant table, or they use the term matrix. The columns are what the, uh, what the RDOC folks call units of analysis. If you take a look at these, you can see that by and large there's sort of hierarchy going on. So genes, make up or contribute to the formation of molecules. Molecules are in cells. Cells are in neural circuits. Uh, the physiology category was added a little bit later. Uh, it's meant to capture things like heart rate variability or skin conductance or um, autonomic responses that are not neural but that are clearly at sort of the same <coughs> biological level as the neural circuits. And then this leads to behavior and self-reports. And depending on whether you're a behaviorist or not, you may say, well, self-reports are just a kind of behavior, or you may think that they give us unique insight that observe behavior other than speech doesn't. But essentially, you can see that there's this hierarchical, more or less hierarchical structure. Paradigms are weird. They are a unit of analysis in the framework, but they are not part of the hierarchy. Essentially, they are referring to um, experimental paradigms that will um, get at the various kinds of phenomena that RDOC is interested in. And the, so these are the columns of the table. I'll show you a couple of screenshots of the RDOC matrix in a minute. Um, the rows are, first of all, divided into four <coughs> main domains of function. So we have negative valence systems, positive valence systems, cognitive systems, social processes, and arousal and regulatory systems. And how this works in practice, or at least online, is that, again, this is a giant table. We have a domain of negative valence systems and then some constructs, the domain of uh, positive valence systems and some constructs. And even though I haven't talked about them yet, the constructs are really the core of the RDOC approach. They are, again, meant to be rooted in um, psychological and neuroscientific research. They're 
fairly well established from a scientific perspective, but the key thing is they don't <coughs> map neatly onto um, psychiatric conditions. So, for example, you might think that uh, anxiety disorders clearly have some link to uh, potential threat for anxiety, but it's not really clear how something like frustrated, frustrated non-reward maps onto any kind of symptom or um, syndrome in the DSM. The constructs are then, in some cases, subdivided into subconstructs, so reward responsiveness is divided into reward anticipation, initial response to reward, reward satiation. And the idea is that you can investigate the construct you're interested in or the subcontract construct you're interested in at any of the various levels of analysis. And RDOC is a fully clickable uh, system. So you can, if you're interested in, and this is the example that I'm gonna show you, uh, in, interested in the um, elements related to the construct of acute threat or fear, you can click and it will show you these are the molecules that have been associated with the construct you're interested in. These are the cells, these are the <coughs> Um Just a point, I actually picked the negative valence systems and the positive valence systems instead of the positive systems, which I think are more interesting because it fit nicely on the screen. Cognitive system just <laughs> big, but I got the um, I, I link to the art matrix open in my web browser. So if anybody has questions, we can look at that together and see what we think. Uh, so again, the idea is these elements are related to the construct of interest, but uh, we don't necessarily know how right now. And even though our doc says it's integrative. Right now, really, it's not making any explicit connections among the different levels. Certainly, there are researchers who are doing this who've had some success at it, but RDOC really is intended to be just an overarching framework. And it's also intended to be work in progress. So the folks at the NIH have been very clear that they're completely open to dropping con uh, constructs if they're not useful, adding new constructs that they haven't thought of, if it turns out that they're going to be really helpful, or tweaking or subdividing a construct into different subconstructs. So it's really, again, meant to be a grand process. If you click on any one of these elements in any one of the, um, the, the different levels of analysis, it refers you back to the domain. So it's this weird kind of circular thing. You just click randomly and end up on um, various pages. But again, it's, it's really kind of a blank framework. It's showing the purported relationship among the domains, the constructs, the elements, and the units of analysis without really filling them in with anything that we would probably be tempted, because Carl's here to talk about in terms of a mechanism. I also want to point out that, again, RDOC is intended to be an ontology for psychiatry, but it also wants to talk about uh, a spectrum of functioning. So whereas the DSM tends to be a categorical um, set of classifications, either you meet criteria or you don't, and there's some hand-waving to be done there, um, our doc explicitly says that they're interested in how these constructs work in people who are healthy, in people who have uh, mental disorder X, people who have mental disorder Y. So they really want to uh, look across a broad range of um, abilities to function and develop a huge picture of what's going on. That said, RDOC is very much a neuroscience category. So again, back to the insult paper, um, they say the primary focus of RDOC is on neural circuitry with levels of analysis progressing in one of two directions, upward from measures of circuitry function to clinically relevant variation, or downwards to the genetic and molecular or cellular factors that ultimately influence such function. So circuits really do kind of have a pride of place in our talk. But if you take a look at all of the circuits that are currently part of the RDOC matrix, they've really helped themselves to a very liberal conception of what counts as a neural circuit. So I just took a screenshot of the alphabetical, as you might guess, uh, of the first, I don't know, maybe dozen and a half dozen circuits listed in RDOC. And you get everything from you know, nuclei, uh, broadening areas, to um, portions of identifiable chunks of brain, 
to um, the entire autonomic nervous system. Right, so again, this is a very sketchy, gappy framework. The idea is that more research will fill this out and we'll get to something more like what I think you would think of as a neural circuit over time. So that's the basics of our doc. Again, it's meant to overcome these problems with the DSM related to heterogeneity, to comorbidity, and to the lack of validity. And the idea is that by rooting research in what we know about psychology and neuroscience, basically the NIMH is betting that ultimately this will lead to better diagnostic categories. <clears throat> and if we think about where art comes from, again, in one sense, it's a really radical change. It's completely getting rid of these categories that have essentially existed for decades that are used for diagnosis and replacing them with something that does not map neatly onto the way that we currently think about mental disorders. But I want to give you sort of a potted history of biological psychiatry to try to convince you that our books in some ways just not novel. It's just the latest iteration of the same uh, approach to biological psychiatry that we've been seeing since, let's go with 1972. So this is probably one of the most famous papers in psychiatry, Diagnostic Criteria for Use in Psychiatric Research. The lead author is John Feiner, who was a resident here in psychiatry, um, so at WashU in the late 60s, early 70s. Everybody else on this paper is a fairly well-known researcher in psychiatry. Um, and what they did in this paper was they looked at, um, they essentially Feiner did a lit review in which he tried to figure out the best way to understand the kinds of psychiatric categories that researchers, or that uh, clinicians and researchers were using at the time. And at the time, Washi was kind of an outlier in psychiatry because it was very biologically focused. By and large, a lot of psychiatry in the US was still very psychoanalytic or psychodynamic in its approach. And because of that, and I don't exactly know how this is supposed to work because I've never gone through analysis, but diagnosis, diagnosis was not really central to psychiatry. And there were studies done that showed that when given the same um, patient or information about the same patient, uh, there was no consistency in diagnosis among even psychiatrists from a very similar theoretical orientation. And then of course the psychiatrists who just completely had no interest in diagnosis altogether. So the motivation behind these final criteria was to take 14 psychiatric illnesses plus secondary depression, so 15, depending on how you count, and get a sense of where the literature was and come up with provisional categories based mostly on clinical description um, for making sure that when researchers were talking to each other, so again, this was meant to be used in psychiatric research, they were talking about the same thing. So, Feiner, as I mentioned, was a resident here. They gave him this project. I think he had sort of said that he was interested in it. But essentially what happened was he'd spend all kinds of time in the library and then meet with these six high-powered psychiatrists who would take a look at the research he'd come up with and the provisional diagnostic categories he had suggested on the basis of this and then critique him. And if anybody here has ever um, done a postdoc, you're probably getting the same kind of weird, uh, like I can't imagine how stressful this would have been for Feiner, but it actually ended up, you know, doing really good things for his career. So again, these criteria were meant to be provisional, they were meant to be used in a research context and to be revised as for the research reason. They're deliberately atheoretical, so based on the criteria of somebody who was coming from a psychoanalytic perspective versus somebody who was coming from a very biological perspective, perspective could agree that this particular patient in front of them met these criteria. But secretly they were intended to be biological. So the idea was that because these would be guiding research, <coughs> these criteria would eventually hook onto underlying biological mechanisms. And if we take a look at one of the 14 final criteria, depression, what we see is that the requirements that Feiner came up with or that were revised by the entire group of authors was dysphoric mood, plus at least five of the following, for appetite or weight loss, sleep difficulty, loss of energy, agitation or retardation, loss of interest in usual activities, feelings of self-reproach or, that should be guilt for you, 
Uh, <laughs> uh, diminished ability to concentrate and your current thoughts of death or suicide. And if that looks familiar to you, it's because it is. So relatively little has changed. The loss of pleasure criteria has been elevated to one of the two possible necessary criteria. Um, there have been a, a few changes, but largely this is actually the same thing. And interestingly, um, Ken Kendler and some colleagues in 2009 published sort of a, an oral history of the finer criteria. And apparently, um, Dennis Cherney, who's a psychiatrist <coughs> as well, got interested in the 80s in the history of the finer criteria. He asked Finer you know, where he came up with these. And with regard to the depression criteria in particular, Finer said, well, we base this on a 1957 paper by Cassidy and a bunch of co-authors in which they listed some criteria that were very similar to these um, and said that a patient needed to meet six of 10. So Cassidy was still alive, Charlie calls him up and says, so can you tell me, you know, why is it that we you went with six out of 10 rather than five or seven or eight. And Cassidy just said, yeah, it sounded about right. Which is a great place to start doing science, right? You start with this hunch, but it's not a great place to end. And of course, given the similarities with the current criteria, it seems that really what happened is that over time, the final criteria kind of got sh shaped a little bit, but essentially reified into these conditions, uh, these criteria that have been largely unchanged for decades. So that was 1972. 1974, Robert Spitzer, who's a psychiatrist in New York, was appointed chair of the DSM Revision Committee. So this is the beginning of the development of the DSM-3. In 1978, Spitzer and some colleagues, including Elon Robbins, who's one of the WashU folks, uh, published what they call the Research Diagnostic Criteria, which again were fairly similar to the FIRE criteria, just refined a little bit. I want to point this out because the way that they frame the problem has started to shift a little bit. So uh, the idea is that um, a crucial problem in psychiatry affecting clinical work as well as research is the generally low reliability of current psychiatric diagnostic procedures. So what we're starting to see here is sure, there's definitely still a research focus, but there's a shift toward diagnosis. And by two years after this, a uh, paper was published in 1980, we get the DSM-3, which essentially solidifies the RDC slash finer approach into the actual diagnostic manual for psychiatry. And as I said, giving up the talk, really there's been very little change <coughs> between the DSM-3, the DSM-3R, the DSM-4, the DSM-4TR, and now the DSM-4. Um, so really, the symptom-based approach has its roots in the early 1970s, has been around for quite a while, has become deeply entrenched, but again, all this time there's this lurking biological um, impetus or motivation for developing these criteria. So in 1992, Samuel, Samuel Bizet, one of the Washi folks again, published sort of a manifesto for biological psychiatry called Why Psychiatry is a and he says, all physicians believe that improvements in diagnosis and treatment will depend to a large degree on advances in basic biomedical knowledge. The more we learn about the body's development, structure, and function at all levels, from the integrative activity of the whole body to cellular and molecular processes, the more likely we are to become effective in understanding, healing, and preventing disease. For psychiatry, of course, this assumption includes special emphasis on advances in the brain. So um, at the time, again, there was still some sort of holdout from a purely biological approach to psychiatry, largely now, but uh, Jose still felt that he needed to establish that there were really no relevant differences between what psychiatrists did and what other physicians did. So this is the beginning of the book. Later in the book, he reiterates some of this stuff. So he says, biological psychiatry represents a perspective for conceptualizing psychiatric disorders in such a way as to integrate psychiatry more closely into the biological sciences. It is not so much based on current knowledge of anatomy and physiology in psychiatric conditions as it is a strategic way of thinking and the expectation that this will lead us to the relevant knowledge. And basically, that's our help. So our app begins with what we know now, tries to link the brain um, to clinical phenomena. It's committed to the idea that the best way for psychiatry to progress is by doing neuroscience. And it's betting that doing better neuroscience 
is more productive, will have important clinical outcomes. So you can sort of summarize everything I've said in the last few minutes by saying that we really don't know that much right now, but we're going to learn more from doing neuroscience, and when we do, the <coughs> practice is going to be better. So again, what I've hoped to have just shown you is that RDOC really isn't all that different than what the biologically motivated or biologically uh, oriented psychiatrists have been saying for the past 40 years or so. So the question is, how likely is it that this bet that our doc and the NIMH are making about the future of psychiatry will actually bear fruit? And again, I totally go back and forth on this, so this is my pessimistic understanding of what's going on. And given what we've been talking about for the past couple of days, I'm going to move really quickly through this because it's not going to be at all surprising to anybody. So remember that the central feature, the central concept of RDOC is the constructs and subconstructs. And these are meant to be rooted in what we currently know about uh, psychology and about cognitive neuroscience. And really, again, what we're doing here is we're setting forth a cognitive ontology. And with the fairly large caveat that RDOC is meant to be a work in progress, really we're, what we're saying is that by doing RDOC-focused research, we're going to get to something like the root uh, elements or atoms, the periodic table or the phrenology head of actual cognition. So Metzinger and Galazzi in 2003 more or less just define or describe a cognitive ontology as setting out the elementary building blocks of cognition. And what I want to suggest is that um, our doc right now is essentially mapping onto cutting edge cognitive neuroscience circa 1988. Okay. So again, here at WashU, the development of PET imaging in particular um, was motivated by the idea that there was all of this work by cognitive psychi psychologists who were breaking down the cognitive tasks or the cognitive uh, processes that um, are you know, characterizing what we actually do as cognitive creatures and breaking them down into their elements, which then essentially would map onto the brain. So Posner et al. published a paper in Science in which they say the hypothesis is that the elementary operations forming the basis of cognitive analyses of human tasks, so the elementary building blocks in our ontology, are strictly localized. Many such local operations are involved in any cognitive task. The task itself is not performed by any single area of the brain, but the operations that underlie the performance are strictly localized. So that's pretty much what RDOC is betting on. Again, it's not saying that the current constructs are going to be strictly localized, but it is betting that further work will refine those constructs, probably into subconstructs, that will map nicely onto the brain in a way that DSI diagnoses just have completely failed to do. And remember that the problems with the DSM diagnoses are heterogeneity, comorbidity, and a lack of validity. Here are the problems I think RDOC has. Uh, there's heterogeneity. Comorbidity has stair quotes around it because, of course, it seems weird to talk about comorbid uh, cognitive elements, but I'll, I'll flesh that out in just a bit. Um, and again, this is moving really fast because I think with this group, this is going to be pretty much what we use to people. So the um, RDOC constructs and some constructs are heterogeneous because different studies find differences in neural correlates of psychological processes. Sure, there's overlap, but it's not like we're converging on a very clear localization for any psychological process. Um, there's also overlap. So whereas heterogeneity shows that there are different areas involved in the task, overlap, which is sort of analogous to comorbidity in my spiel, uh, says that there are uh, different tasks that use the same brain regions. So really this initial hope of a one-to-one -one brain it is pretty much toast. Uh, and then finally, these also, just as with DSM, point to problems with validity. So um, Mike Anderson, in his 2015 uh, philosophy compass paper, expresses it by saying that there's a growing realization that cognitive processes do not map to the brain in any straightforward way. So I think that that's a problem. 
How am I doing for time? Less 
unity focused, a lot less unity focused than they are. But I think that if we sort of think about this as kind of a regulative ideal that we can think about mechanisms and integration across levels and use that to sort of think about how various um, approaches to this kind of research and various sorts of paradigms might fit into an idealized bigger picture, then that might actually be kind of useful. And I also think that this shifts the focus away from explanation to prediction in some interesting ways, because if what we're after is the kind of um, mechanistic explanation that Croft, for example, has worked on, uh, we're, again, pulling away from the clinic. So I want to think about ways that something vaguely or Dockian could be reoriented toward the clinic. And instead of talking about transforming diagnosis, I want to think in terms of refining diagnosis using, again, vaguely or Dockian. <coughs> so this is a paper on the dissociative subtype of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, which was published not too long before the DSM-5 came out. The dissociative subtype is now recognized in the um, DSM. And these are a bunch of researchers in PTSD. Full disclosure, I worked with Ruth Lanius as a grad student and as a postdoc, so I'm picking this largely because it's what I know about. Um, I don't know whether she thinks about this in the context of RDOC. I should probably ask her, but she's really not philosophical, so she'd probably just look at me funny. <laughs> mm. Which is great. <laughs> so, Basically, uh, what Ruth was doing, and this was before I came along, was using a fairly well-established um, paradigm for understanding what's going on in the brain in post-traumatic stress disorder, script driven imagery. So you ask a patient to tell you about a traumatic event, and about a neutral event, and you develop 30-second scripts that they then listen to in the scanner, and you ask them to use the script to help them focus their memory on this event. And to, you're, you're supposed to create the script using very evocative, emotional, and sensory terms to really help people to sort of um, recapture the memory. And what we found is that about 70% of people that she scanned had what's now known as a hyperarousal response. So they were very agitated by the memory, they had increased heart rate, they reported having very strong sensory memories, some of them even had full blown flashbacks. The other 30% had dissociative symptoms. So they numbed out, uh, they had no change in heart rate or even decreased heart rate. We actually had one woman, which was really freaking me out, who completely remembered nothing of the scan. So the second, the, well, I don't know about the second, but uh, when she started hearing the script, she just zoned out completely. And I was asking her after to rate her response. And she's like, I don't know, I don't know. I'm like, I don't think the scale is built for this. <laughs> Um, so what she found is that in addition to these uh, clinical, clinically very different responses, um, as compared with healthy controls who had experienced trauma but not to develop PTSD, there were very diff uh, clear differences in brain activity. So this formed the basis of Ruth's research career. Uh, she started working with other people who had very different um, academic backgrounds and different sorts of skills. And so when they laid out the case for the dissociative subtype, uh, in 2012, they had developed a basic neural causal model. They had analyzed this in terms of symptoms, and they did factor analyses that showed that um, the dissociative symptoms clustered and the hyperarousal or the core PTSD symptoms clustered. They were correlated, but they couldn't be distinguished statistically. They looked at patient histories to identify different risk factors and also to talk about prognosis. Um, and they were beginning to be able to link um, the two subtypes to different treatment recommendations. So I think this is actually the sort of thing that RDOC is wanting to come up with, but that it's really based on a very loose idea of integration. Um, there's a bunch of different tools that we can use, a bunch of different approaches that we can take that all seem to point in the same clinical direction. And that's really useful, but it's a long, long way from integration. So that's what I have that passes for optimism today. Thank you very much. I want to talk a bit on kind of the scope of the biological explanation. Right. So imagine you have a car that you're driving around the machine, right? And they solve the roads. And so if you drive it long enough, it's going to rust, right? Um, but that rust can cause the car to break in a lot of different ways, right? Right. Stop working with the sort of network or the field network or whatever. 
kind of take it to a different person in each of those figs, and then you give different names for each of them. The underlying mechanism is kind of the same, right? right. And that's kind of, I mean, if you look, so I have a colleague, Robert Builder from UCLA, who has this term range schmutz, which he says is like the, the null hypothesis for what's going on in psychiatric disorders, that there's like a, a general some, a general brain mess of itness that ramifies in all these different ways that have different, you know, sort of symptom labels. But and if you look at the, if you kind of squint and look at the genetics and that you kind of see that, right? That there's like a bunch of different genes are involved that, you know, they all seem to maybe have something to do with like, you know, particular ion channels that have to do with brain function. Um, but it's and it's not, I mean, other than maybe a distinction between like internalizing and you know psychotic disorders, like the imaging basically it's like everybody with a with a diagnosis kind of has the same brain mess of itness. Um, so what's your take on like you know that's that's we always want kind of explanations that fit at the level of the the symptoms, but right. what if the explanation is really something much lower level that just happens to ramify in a bunch of different ways for accidental reasons? So I'd be totally okay with that, <laughs> um, is the short answer. Um, the slightly longer answer is if you think back to the history of psychiatry where you know, there was sort of this broad distinction between psychotic disorders and neurotic disorders, or um, what's the crippling end of dementia precox, and what's the depressive depression analog. Anyway, yeah, I mean, we have this whole sort of proliferation of diagnostic categories <coughs> that may or, not be, may or may not be actually useful. Um, I think there's probably some distinctions to be made even at the level of Schmutz, but I don't want to make any bets as to what they are. Um, and I think this is part of a uh, thing where sort of the practical issues are actually really useful. So I'm going to take off my philosopher of science hat and put on my biophysicist hat for a minute because people keep making me wear it, so I might as well own it. Um, if what we're actually after is helping patients with the problems that they're experiencing, anything that works is pretty good. I mean, anything that works that doesn't involve sacrificing small children or you know, other deeply problematic things, you know, that, that's really what we want. And so this is why I kind of feel that there's this tension between the explanatory and the predictive slash clinical thing, because, you know, on the one hand, there's the, the really clinical focus, like how is this going to make a difference to me? And then there's the more scientific focus that says, well, let's see what the Schmutz actually looks like <coughs> in some way. So yeah, I guess back to the short answer, totally good. Um, one other thing, so the, the car metaphor, um, it's interesting that you, you use that because there's clearly an external cause here, and even though it doesn't appear in the Ariadne matrix, um, the um, NIMH folks say that there's a third axis, which is the developmental trajectory, and then they also want to build in the environment. So they basically kind of want to make art on all things for all people, but they haven't really accounted for the external perturbations of any interest. Uh, thank you very much for that. I especially appreciate the history because some of that was unknown to me, despite the fact that, like I said, you're an actual psychiatrist. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say I wrote a couple of grants under the RDOT framework. Right. And you'd think I might know a little bit about it. Um, one really interesting thing about RDOT is, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm a little nervous about that camera there, but it, the the almost complete. Uh, amateurish quality mm -hmm. of the matrix so that uh, in all honesty it looks like somebody had an undergraduate RA right. and made a list of a few cognitive ser nerve terms from cognitive neuroscience textbooks right. and some terminology I mean for example uh, attention isn't given any subconstructs right. and ascending descending information pathways and I don't even know what that is appears as one of the physiological markers. This isn't plausible to anybody. And yet, I'm a very big advocate of RDOC. So yeah, how do I square right. the circle there? Well, yeah. I don't view it itself, its content, as being meaningful as any sort of accurate representation of reality. It doesn't even aspire to do that. Uh, or it, it, I, That's way too strong. Right. It, it's not, it can't be taken seriously as that. But it is intended to catalyze a kind of sociological change among researchers in particular. That is, quit writing your grants at the granularity of schizophrenia and start writing your grants at this level of granularity. Here's a matrix that we're going to wave, you know, throw some hand waving on, but you get the basic idea, now you go figure it out. Yes. Uh, so, you know, 
Th that's the way I, I think in which I am very much in the Ardakian frame, and I don't think that its, its content is, is, is worth anything right now. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> Just give me my first answer to everything, right? Um, I think you're right. Uh, I think we can learn from this that you should at least get a resident in psychiatry because the finer criteria did appear to actually be more useful than you're thinking the art of matrix with its undergraduate, hypothetical undergraduate is. Um, I mean, ARDOC is very clear that it's meant to be a work in progress, that it's meant to be refined, that it's meant to be a community-focused thing. So if you look at the website, they, they invite feedback. And I don't know how seriously they take that, but in the times that, I, in the time that I've been <coughs> sort of tracking ARDOC as an outsider, I have seen some significant changes, like the addition of the physiological paradigm. Um, the other thing, and I don't know if you can see this, but um, the uh, column for genes used to just have a bunch of candidate genes and now they just have a note that basically says yeah that didn't work we're going with gene loss but we don't know how to think about it if you want to apply for a grant talk to your program officer so i mean it's good but i also worry that because the funder criteria started that way and then got completely reified and solidified in ways that were problematic that this might also be the case um, the other thing I want to say is we really need a sociologist for this because i suspect what happened is not so much the undergrad but so many people with different um, Access to grind sounds nasty, but um, so many um, different vested interests and, and research programs that they wanted to figure out. So really what ended up happening is that it kind of washed it into something that most people could more or less sign on to. So, well, I was a part of the cognitive systems RDOC group, and so <laughs> it was <laughs> not it's not it's not you don't need to be very about the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's exactly what you're saying, is try to get 20 people in a room and yeah. try to get them to address anything Basically, it becomes the undergraduate version is all they can agree on. <laughs> and that's on today's so, so right now. <laughs> Given my admiration for all the stuff that you've done, and that's, and that's, that, that's not any sort of sugarcoating or anything like yeah. that. Given the genuine ad admiration, I am shocked that that was the upshot of the committee. Because uh, it, it doesn't look Go very... look at the list of people. It's people who actually know some stuff. Um, oh, I didn't know there was a list of people on there. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, can like, see who was on the different, who came to the different meetings. Yeah. No, we sat there for two days and they gave us this matrix and said, hey, come back and tell us what should be on the matrix. And that's what 15 or so famous people could come up with. Thank you, God. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Were you going to follow up on that, or is this a well, I, I, Thanks. It was really interesting. I, I learned about, I, I, I've kind of watched this RDOC thing from a distance because so many people seem up in arms about it. And, I, and one night I was talking with a local, fantastically cantankerous and opinionated neuroscientist who, um, uh, 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 and I said something that I think was, because I have these mechanistic inclinations, something that sounds somewhat similar to what you're. You know, this sort of mechanistic take on, on this sounds all perfectly reasonable. Why not abandon this taxonomy that's not been getting us very far, start focusing on the individual cognitive faculties and understanding those things. That all sounds right. But what he said uh, in response, in somewhat grumpier terms than I'll express it, is that uh, there are also uh, this thing about paradigms that you've got yeah, there. Yeah, right. um, and that in order to get the funding, you've actually got to use the tests that they prescribe. And you have to use it. Are there, are there also approved animal models for these different things that you have to use the one and not the other? And then, then I think there was a concern on his part that not on the ontology side, well, I mean, I guess this is all ontology in a way, uh, right, but, but, but that, there were, that, that, that researchers were being shackled yeah. Um, two paradigms and and, uh, and and animal models that were restrictive on the, on the free space of scientific investigation. That was the, the, the character of the objection, and you didn't mention any of that. So is that is that accurate? I or, don't know. Okay. But I think that this actually goes to show that you know my title is pretty apt. I think you know one of the things with the, the DSM is that um, people would complain about trying to make finer grain distinctions within categories or cut across categories in their research and it was remarkably hard to get work that did that published because it just didn't fit the mold and it seems like you know this might be sort of the same issue except kind of from a top down rather than a peer focus but, but is it the case that they say you've got to use these these tests and these animal models or that you can get no funding idea. from yeah. Yeah. I, well i mean the, the study section might expect you to 
do that, but as far as I know, the NIH hasn't specified that you have to use any particular, and I don't know about animal models, that may well be the case, but at least for, for the stuff that, for cognitive work, um, it's really the study section decides, you know, whether that's reasonable or not. There's, as far as I know, there's no prescription to, the only real prescription that came, as far as, as I can tell, the only real prescription that came out of our doc was stop talking about diagnoses. Well, and, and also it has to have something to do with neuroscience, right? So, sure, yeah, um, yeah. of course, with the, the Turkheimer thing, that it, you know, it's totally leaving out environmental and social and familial stuff. But, uh, and, and our next response is, no, do that, but we get back to the brain. So, you hear? Oh, um, yeah, I just, I, I have never used or not, but I've heard like, some psychiatrists talk about it. And, and just the impression I got, and it, and it could be wrong because it's distilled from all people that I've heard talk about it is that um, what they like about it is it seems like it's better at sort of cataloging symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the impression I've ever always gotten of the DSM is it's almost like a building code, you know? It's yeah, like, right. we yeah. have to do something for this patient who's in front of us and we have to put something down. And, and it's so usually not otherwise specified, right? So. But they really they're just trying something and they don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And as I said, when I was talking a little bit about what, what's in the matrix, some of the constructs do seem to, like, if you tilt your head and squint a little, map onto some of the symptom stuff. There's also this other approach that I don't know a ton about, but it's essentially leaving aside diagnosis, but going straight to the symptoms and trying to do factor analytic type things to figure out how symptoms cluster and whether that's a better way of identifying clinically, uh, potentially researchy relevant uh, ways of classifying people. Um, I think that's probably promising, but I don't know if I'd to comment. It's my understanding still that the regulatory agencies consider the practice of medicine to be an art. <laughs> and I don't see the artfulness of the individual healthcare provider right. accounted for in what you said. So yes. So you've opened a whole massive can of worms for me. <laughs> I'm going to try to keep the it worms yet, but um, my other big area of research is evidence-based medicine, which have much the same criticisms that it's like cookbook medicine, and there's no room for the art of medicine. And um, I think that I interpret our doc thinking a lot about what I know about how the evidence-based medicine movement really did become reified in uh, an interesting way. Um, and I honestly, I mean, people have written so much and so much better than I could about the relationship between medicine as a science and medicine as an art or medicine as a practice and medicine as something that is informed by science but not a science. Um, and I guess the art of response might just be, well, yeah, but we're not doing medicine, we're doing research. Um, and we sort of hand it to the clinicians to, to do what they want with it. But I, I think they're sidestepping exactly the point that you raised. But no one listens to me. Yeah, I was wondering, um, you know, I was just trying to think about the, um, you know, the idea of integrated multi-level mechanism in this context and, um, you know, how if, if, if things were, you know, kind of simple enough, you would have, you know, genes that cause circuit uh, abnormalities that cause particular symptoms that then, you know, would result in disorder. But when, um, you know, things are a lot messier just in, in like all cases of somatic, you know, medicine and, Cancer biology, you have all of these um, places where there's you know diffuse genetic and environmental risk factors that have a lot of that and say one after the other, you know, pathway, but then you can also have the same cancer arise from, you know, a completely different, you know, cell vision control pathway that has its own set of, you know, so you get sort of multiple genetic and environmental risk factors, multiple kind of physiologic, you know, points of interest mm -hmm. that then kind of come back in diffuse ways for the actual thing. Yeah. And so what I was curious about is whether um, there are, whether the RDOC effort has in it sort of ways, you know, whether there's any talk about how you sort of take research that uses the framework and develop sort of yeah. theories about the structure. No, of the, no I don't think it really does. I think, you know, it, it's wanting to offer the framework and then let the researchers run with it. Um, and I think that your question actually is, it, it has some overlap with what Russ asked. Right? Um, there's also the fact that uh, in cell, and at least some of his uh, work, talks a, a lot about RDOC as precision medicine. 
right? So very much um, <coughs> inspired by some of the stuff that's been going on in cancer biology and the way that that has influenced treatment. Um, I know Katie Tao has been doing some work on that, but I don't know exactly what that is. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, I really would love for our rock to work. I, I think that the idea that we can come up with these um, beautiful, refined, explanatory and predictive um, understandings of the brain and mental disorder would totally rock. But I know. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask a question to clarify a bit more how symptoms fit into the r framework. So um, one way you might describe the beginning of the talk is saying, look, it's treating um, mental disorders as these cluster of symptoms which gives rise to the three problems for the DSM that you mentioned. Right. Um, and so at least potentially a way of avoiding those problems is to focus away from uh, clusters of symptoms and um, individuating um, psychiatric kinds. Right. Um, and that kind of comports with um, uh, a way of thinking about sort of illness more generally which we find kind of natural. Mm -hmm. So famously, um, Hillary Putnam said that the diseases are not logical constructions out of the things. Um, and it's true, Putnam only discusses, I think it was multiple sclerosis and um, polio. Um, but he points out that there's a consequence of that, that it would be possible for someone to have polio or multiple sclerosis, but could be completely asymptomatic, um, or to have all of the canonical symptoms, but right. fail to, to have the disease. Um, now, it, it doesn't seem to me that our doc is actually committed to this kind of extreme view, but I just raise it to kind of better understand how um, symptoms sort of fit into the framework. Uh, you could have a view according to which it would make perfect sense um, to be clinically depressed, but to be asymptomatic just because you've got the, whatever the brain, the yeah. brain stuff is, right. but that seems not to make sense at all. Yeah, um, I mean, sorry. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, and so then the question is um, how exactly to think about the importance of symptoms in relation to this. I mean, they were quite low on the list, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't think really says anything about this, and here's one possible reason why. Um, so I mentioned that the DSM is a categorical approach to diagnosis. If you only have four of the nine depression symptoms, you are not diagnosed with depression. But intuitively, we would all say, you know, this person is kind of depressed, right? Or mildly depressed. Well, maybe not even mildly depressed, but depressed-ish, maybe. Um, and our doc really wants to move to a more dimensional uh, approach. So whatever it is that causes <coughs> depression or whatever depression ends up looking like under the new symptom or under the new system is the result of a mechanism or a set of mechanisms that we all have and that in most people who are not depressed function so-called normally and then you can have sort of a spectrum of dysfunction. Um, and I think that that is progress, but uh, it, it's a slightly orthogonal, slightly orthogonal to your actual question. But I think that's sort of the motivation for not talking about symptoms, um, because the symptoms are seen as arising out of the function of the mechanism rather than as a central thing. Um, there's this big debate, of course, in uh, philosophy of medicine between people who follow Christopher Bourse and say that, that, uh, that disease is a uh, biological malfunction or statistical abnormality. So it makes perfect sense to say that somebody is diseased, but they don't have symptoms, so they're not ill, and that's forces we have distinguishing. And then the, the normativist approach, which says that there is a functional aspect to disease, so that you can talk about things like having you know, subclinical hypertension or something like that, but um, that really we want to talk about disease in terms of um, uh, experiences symptoms or of suffering in some way or the inability to do certain things. So I, I actually hadn't thought about that, but now I want someone to write that paper. So I, did that answer your question at all? Uh, yeah. Just sort of wander around. Yeah, yeah.